I've jumped in uh, with a two hour from beginning to end prepared presentation for you um, about SEO. So you're getting a double dose of SEO. Um, I've called it, won't somebody think of the robots? And what I want to talk to you about is the parts of SEO that happen that are really, really important that you can't see as a user. So they commonly get overlooked. So this talk is for one, people who are managing website projects. So there's going to be five things I talk about and you'll have a list to kind of be, if you're in that situation, have we done this? Okay. Um, it's for you if you're working in SEO to improve your relationship with developers. And if you are a developer, um, I've got some kind of technical implementation bits in here as well uh, for you. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Mark Williams Cook. I'm a director at Canda. Um, I've been working in SEO for about 15 years. Um, I spent a few of those years um, as an affiliate marketer, kind of sitting at home, getting up at the crack of midday, um, <laughs> working on my own websites, thinking it was amazing. And for anyone that has worked at home for a kind of a long period, you might be able to sympathise or empathise that you do after a while, you're kind of like, I hope that pigeon comes back. It's kind of lonely. So I decided it'd be a good idea to go agency side, so I now look kind of more like this. Um, and I've had really, really been really lucky. I've got to work with people like Expedia, Hitachi, Fatface, and really get some big SEO challenges, um, which is something I never would have done if I kind of stayed um, like that. Um, one thing I have noticed, right, and this is, so this is as coming into agencies with development teams, and especially when we go and talk to clients who have in-house development teams, is you get introduced as, hey, here's Mark, he's the SEO, and developers kind of look at you like this. They're like, <laughs> all right, there's the guy who's going to tell me I'm doing my job wrong, and he's going to get it all wrong. Um, and it's kind of fair enough, because you'll find, um, and maybe I'm in this group, some of the loudest people that talk about SEO sometimes, not always, give some of the worst advice. Um, so that does manage to trickle down and you get problems where developers are told to do things and it turns out it was wrong and it's a waste of time. Um, and it's kind of frustrating because the people who do uh, kind of really get into it and understand it give very frustrating answers. Um, so they realise the complexity and you'll ask them a question and they'll be like, well, it depends, or maybe. And that's kind of the truth, because there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. So I've got five things I want to whiz through um, that you might come across um, and why they are really important and you, 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 might miss, you might miss them in your build. Um, so the first one, it's got a really kind of long, scary name, um, faceted navigation and canonicals. Um, but I guarantee you all know what I'm talking about. Um, it's like if we're, if we're going to buy some running shoes and I do a search for men's running shoes and I come here on the Nike website, you've probably all done online shopping and we're all aware um, we can do things like we can change the sorting. So we can say, okay, I want to sort by price or I want to sort by size. Now, as humans, this is super easy to understand that these two things are basically the same page, right? Um, and I can share one or I can share another with someone to say, here, here's what I'm looking at. The problem lies with search engines that to do this, to change this order, we normally change something in the URL. And why this is a problem is that search engines think a new page is just something with a new URL. So the situation you end up in is you might have 20 different versions of this page and Google's like, well, hang on, there's 20 pages that say men's running shoes. I don't know which one to rank. And the end scenario you have is rather than having one page that ranks really well, you get one pop up and it's like 10th and then another 20th and you just don't rank at all. Fortunately, we do have um, something in our toolbox to fix this, which Nike have done. Um, it's called a canonical tag for developers. This is kind of now really coming into, I see it a lot in dev cycles, but it's been around for years and it was ignored for years. And it's essentially a way of saying to Google, hey, if you've got lots of these pages that look similar, this is the one, this is the original one. So any links or um, any time you rank this page, this is the one we want to show. So 
You can forgive a developer for maybe missing this because they're focused, rightly so, on the user. And this is no user problem, you know, we don't care about this, we understand it. Search engines don't. So it's one example where, as an SEO, you add value because there's something you're doing for robots that might otherwise get missed in the development cycle. Um, as you can tell, I've probably I've got a couple examples of these. So this is actually, um, we did a technical audit on one of the UK's largest cashback sites. Um, this was back in sort of 2014. It's a good example of how long these canonicals have been a thing. And just solving this issue across a page with a few million, a site with a few million pages, took them from about 600,000 visitors a month to around about 1.3, 1.4 million visitors a month, just solving this one issue. So the amount of pages Google thought they had went right down, but it started to realize which ones should rank. Um, so this problem really kind of scales with big sites. And there's, there's a 1B here as well, which is, as I said earlier, things are quite complicated, right? So it's not always enough to just read the best practice and say, right, that's how I'm going to do it, which is, again, really tempting to do as a developer because you follow the documentation, right? So to give a techie example, these canonical tags we're talking about, there's a way to put them on your website using Google Tag Manager, which is a tool Google's got. You can put them on with JavaScript. And then what happened was we were doing this for some clients with some good success. And we do it this way because their website's old and it's hard to update. And we're like, brilliant, this works really well. And then Google last year said, oh, if you, if you do this through Tag Manager, it won't work. And I was like, huh, that's weird because we're doing it and it's working. So I said to Google, hey, we're kind of doing this. So is, it, is, there, like a, is there an exception if we use your tools that's allowing it to work? And Google said, no, it, it's never worked. It doesn't work. And I was like, huh. It really seems to be working. And then someone who was um, kind of a lot more switched on and uh, motivated than me did a full-blown study and found out actually um, Google was wrong about their own technology and it absolutely <laughs> definitely worked. Um, and they weren't trying to intentionally mislead us as a community. It just so happened that these things are genuinely really complicated. So it can be difficult to know where do you get your SEO advice from if sometimes you can't even trust Google. So sometimes experience does win out. Um, so the summary here is basically, even with simple things like telling two things apart, which look very different, Google's sometimes really bad at it and can get it wrong. Um, <clears throat> another great example is site migrations. So site migrations is, is different types of migrations we do. It might be you migrate your design, it might be you migrate your platform, it might be you redo your whole website. And one thing that scares me is we speak to clients and they say something like, oh, don't worry, our developer said they're redirecting everything. It's handled. Um, and my heart rate starts to rise because it's not, again, it's not that simple. Um, there's a level of correctness you need to get to, and technically correct is the best kind of correct in these situations. And I've got a great example for you. So House of Frasier, rest in peace, had um, a very simple job to do, which was they were going to migrate from their non-secure to new secure URLs. Dead easy. All you have to do is redirect one to the other. No problem. Now, when they went through the development bureaucracy, what ended up happening was actually three or four different hops before we got there. And again, to a user, if you're testing that, hey, it works. Yeah, we tested it, we went to a page, and you know, it took less than a second, and I got there in my browser. So got through, got published, got live. This did not go down well with Google. House of Frasier halved their search visibility after this migration went live. That's around three, three and a half million organic visitors per month that represents. So I'll let you work out their conversion rate, average basket, how much money that cost them. And again, this came from things that are kind of invisible. You can test it for the user and it works fine, but someone who isn't doing SEO or someone who's doing SEO hasn't got involved and, and had a look at that. Um, we had a really similar situation where this is from a, a proposal I did. Um, about four or five months ago, had a client come to us and say, hey, we, we moved site about seven or eight months ago um, with someone else. We did a full migration. 
you did full migration. Yeah, developers said they redirected everything, fine. Um, and we've lost about 30% of our traffic year on year. And this is a company that um, their leads were high worth leads and they pretty much relied on traffic from Google. So this meant, bottom line, they've probably lost a quarter of their revenue, which is significant, you know, it's massive for a company like this. So luckily they had the analytics for the old site, we looked through it, and actually we found that over 50% of their old URLs were not redirected. And it was all things like where there was URLs like we saw earlier with different options in and tracking URLs, marketing URLs that had links. Those links were getting the website to rank and they'd been forgotten about. So we ordered it and found that 900 of them went to dead pages. Another 400 caused server errors. And this is what's caused um, this drop for them. And again, if you just visited an old page as a user, kind of testing it, it went to the new site, everything's fine, put it live. <clears throat> uh, JavaScript. So JavaScript is super exciting. Um, I kind of feel like this when JavaScript comes up because it is the future of the web um, in many ways. There's lots of exciting things you can do about it, but from an SEO point of view, it's kind of terrifying um, because there's this misunderstanding that Google can understand JavaScript. So it doesn't matter what JavaScript framework we use, yeah, Google can sort that out. Um, and that's maybe like a quarter truth. So what's actually happening is we're all aware of our friendly uh, Googlebot, which will come and look at our websites. And all Googlebot's doing is checking for links on a page. Okay? It's not executing any JavaScript. So this means if, for argument's sake, you had a website and it <coughs> needed JavaScript to load up the links, Googlebot would go there and be like, oh, it's just the one page. Never mind. Send that page back which goes to Caffeine, which is Google's indexer, which will then execute the JavaScript. And it will find, oh, it had 10 links on it, brilliant, and it will send Googlebot back to look at those 10 links. The issue is that executing JavaScript is really resource heavy, and Google told us at the Chrome Dev Summit it can take up to a week from when Googlebot finds that page to when they render it. So if you've got parts of your site that are reliant on JavaScript, if you've got a 10,000 page site, it's going to take weeks or months for Google to get around your site. And you can imagine this has huge impact on the types of results that come up in search and how you rank. Um, there's actually a technical solution. So for devs in the room, um, Google recommends this thing called dynamic rendering, which is kind of what they call cloaking nowadays, which is that you deliver your your website as usual to users and they can they can you know the users they can understand they can deal with it and you have what's called a server-side rendered version for Googlebot which basically means you run all the JavaScript how the page ends up that's what you give Google so you're literally giving two different copies of your site out depending who's asking for it and this is one of the ways around these technical hurdles again we've seen sites go live um, with these frameworks and it's absolutely hamstrung rankings and it's everyone scratching their heads because it's like I don't understand we did a test crawl and it all worked and the user testing was fine and it's another example of this invisible kind of SEO. Um, this is kind of my last one so internationalization um, so that's when you have a website and it's available in multiple countries multiple languages or both um, and again, the common mistake is we'll see someone say, hey, we'll just redirect users automatically to their country. That's the easiest thing to do, right? That's helpful. Um, interestingly, as of a few months ago, if you're doing that quite aggressively, it's actually illegal now inside the EU to do that, um, which is one reason not to do it. Um, but for many years, it's actually Google Webmaster guidelines have been really clear on this. So this says, do not use IP analysis to adapt your content. IP location analysis is difficult and generally not reliable. Furthermore, Google may not be able to crawl variations of your site properly. That's because our friendly Googlebot normally comes from the US of A. So when it's landing on your site, if you're redirecting people based on where you think they're from, it's pretty much always going to land on the US version. So all the other versions of your site basically pretty much go uncrawled, don't rank properly. Um, the solution is something like Apple where you just offer 
um, offer the user which version they want and you can save that and they can change it. Um, but the, the SEO behind the scenes is, again, there's a tool in our box to deal with this called hreflang annotations, where you can specify to Google, this is the US version, this is the Spanish version, um, and you can, you can specify different languages for one place as well. So for instance, in Switzerland, you can say, here is the French version for Switzerland, here is the Swiss German version for Switzerland, here's the Italian version, etc. And what this will do is, it will give you a much better chance of the correct page just ranking in Google automatically, which is what you want. Um, all of these, when we publish the slides online, I've kind of linked you to um, the extra information you need as well. Um, lastly, something I'm not going to talk about, but I just want to mention, is schema. Schema is super important for SEO. The reason I'm not going to talk about it is we had Andrew Martin standing here eight weeks ago who gave a brilliant 20-minute presentation on schema. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, watch it. Um, it's very important. Um, it's one of the two things Google said to focus on for 2018. So if you haven't focused on it yet, we're in 2019. Um, so you can play catch up. Um, and I guess the thing I want, want to end with is if you are a developer um, or if you are an SEO, just focus on the fact that good developers do need good SEOs to help them out um, and vice versa. So you know, while we'll do our best to keep up with these technologies, if you're a developer, you're the person on the front line doing the job and we're relying on you to help us do that as good as we can. That's everything I have to tell you um, about SEO. Thank you. <clears throat>